We're going to read from God's word now. So why don't you grab your Bibles or your device and please turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 13 all the way down to chapter 4, verse 11. So it's Matthew chapter 3, starting from verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Well, for much of this year, we're going to be looking at Matthew's gospel together at the refuge and really looking forward to that. Uh, so I encourage you to have your passages or the that passage open in front of you on your device because uh, we're going to be referring to it. We At the refuge, we believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe it's a powerful word to his people and a challenging word to us always. And that's why we want to make sure that when we come to the Bible, that we listen to what God has said and indeed what God says through his word. And we want to make sure that we respond to it as God's word, um, as the God who speaks to us. And so today we're, we're looking at these, uh, these sentences, these verses in, in Matthew 3 and 4. You know, imagination is good, isn't it? Uh, we encourage people to use their imaginations. You come to places like this, the schools, and schools are uh, where children are supposed to use their imaginations to come up with um, thoughts on a bit of paper or to, you know, to depict different things that they're, that they're very much at the forefront of their minds. Imagination is good. But there's also a sense, isn't there, where our imaginations can run right and actually lead us astray. And the Bible says that we are made in God's image. But I think too often uh, people, humanity, you and I have substituted the God of the Bible with a God that we have made in our own imagination, in our own image. Instead of us being made in God's image, we've made God in our image. The God who suits our expectations or the God who suits our preferences, the God who is most aligned to my personality or our priorities. I like to think of God being the God of my idea and my ideals, the God who's at my beck and call but doesn't require much from me in return a God who gives us what we want at the same time withholds from us what we don't want. And the passage that we're looking at today together from Matthew's gospel, and it doesn't let us do that. Not if we really look at it, not if we really listen to what God says, not if we really take note of what God does here in Jesus, because this is the, as God really is. This is the God who's really there. This is the God who's, well, really here, the God of reality. And I guess the question for all of us today, myself included, is, is, is this, is this the God of your reality? This is the God of my reality. 
See, most religions have a God that demands what it is that those that God's followers are to do. But this God, the God of the Bible, is the God who does for us what we are unable to do. Jesus is the God who does for us what we couldn't and indeed what we wouldn't do for ourselves. And if you're willing today, you'll see how that works in this passage in Matthew's gospel. And we've got there the depiction of the baptism of Jesus. Have a look again at sentence number 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, well, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's, it's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then it says, and then John consented. I think we, we need to look at that and just see there this amazing humility in Jesus. We're, we're told in 15 that he does this to fulfill all righteousness. That is, he, he submits to God's requirements of God's law, even though he's the only person who has perfectly kept God's law. He fulfills all righteousness, even though he is actually perfect in his righteousness. He enters into the practice of a sacrificial system, even though he's the perfect lamb of God who, who came to take away the sin of the world. He sits under the teachings of the, the Torah, the law, and the, the prophets, like our Old Testament, even though he knows that the law and the prophets are all talking about him. He humbly submits to being baptized by John, even though John is right, isn't he, when he says in sentence 13 there, I should, I need to be baptized by you. And you, you come to me? My friend, Jesus is amazing in the way in which he does that. Jesus is God, and, and Jesus is amazing in the way in which he is humble, like this. He's, he's, I tell you, he's so unlike me in, in everything he does. And I'd say he's so unlike you as well. I don't know if you sat up last night and watched the Australian Open, watched Ash Barty have a win. Did we all see it? Yeah. Uh, or how awesome was it? I mean, it's just so good. But it's interesting, isn't it? You see them walking back behind the courts or underneath the courts there, and they've, they've all got their lanyards on and their ID. And, and it's like we all know who they are, and I'm sure the people who are at the doors all know who they are, but they've all got their lanyards on, and, 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 and the, the lanyards, you know, the players and the officials, they wear them so that they are able to get to parts of the arena where they need to go. And, and you know, it's Rod Laver Arena, and I was watching the other day, and Rod Laver was actually there being escorted through and, and, and shown around and all this sort of stuff, introduced to people, and he had his lanyard on. It's his arena. His name's on it. But he's got the lanyard on and, you know, he's showing it so that he can go from one place if they don't know who he is. But there he is. He's doing it. He's got his card out, his credentials, in order to get to the places where you and I can't get to, in order to get to the spaces where, well, it's right that they've got access to those things. And you and I, we look at that and we go, yeah, well, that's, that's right. These people should be able to go to places where I can't get to. They should have some advantages in the tennis world anyway of, that I don't have. It's amazing to me then that when I look at the Bible and I read about Jesus in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can read them, that Jesus never pulls out the God card. He never pulls out the Messiah lanyard. He, he never displays the heavens access all areas QR code. He submits and he serves 
strong and kind. We just sung. He's humble and he's gentle. He's compassionate and he's patient. 14, but John tried to deter him, saying, I didn't be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Look what he says in 15. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, there's a clear message, and I think it's, a, it's a obvious off the page that, that there's a challenge for all of us there to think about, well, where do we sit in terms of baptism? Where do we sit in terms of this sort of public display of, of our connection to Jesus and our relationship with Jesus? And that's something that, that we'd love to have that conversation with you about. But I want to think about that, that the reality of, of I think, the, the foundation there is, is more the, the humility that Jesus shows there, and he does it in the next part as well. And I think I need to remember what Jesus does here the next time I, I'm tempted to think about what I'm due. I need to remember that the next time I'm tempted to complain about doing something that I figure is just unnecessarily difficult or, or complicated or, you know, just a hassle or, or uncomfortable. You know, you know, when I complain about the other drivers who are causing this congestion, that they should know that I need to be somewhere. Or, or, or the people in the line ahead of me. And the fact that they should know that I'm late for an appointment and they're in my way. Or, or the people who've got me on hold on the phone. Uh, surely they should know how busy I am. See, I need to remember that the next time I'm tempted to think that other people exist to make my life easier, that they're not. They're not. And I need to remember that the next time I'm tempted to put myself first, that I mustn't. See, it makes it interesting, doesn't it? That the very next thing that happens after Jesus is baptised, is that Jesus is tempted? Have you thought about why that happens that way? I mean, talk about humility. Friends, it's all over today's passage. He's had the credentials declared from heaven. This is my son. I love him. I am pleased with him, says that in, in sentence 17. And then we have chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, or if you like, tested by the devil. And before we move on and just talk about the rest of it, let your world be rocked by what it says there in sentence 1 of chapter 4. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be, in order to be, for the reason to be tempted by the devil. That's amazing. Guys, the gospel, the Christian gospel, it is amazing. And, of course, the Trinity is all over this passage, in plain sight for all to see if you choose to see. The Son is baptized, the Spirit descends like a dove, the Father speaks. The Spirit leads the Son into the wilderness. It's there for you to see if you bother to look. But the, re, the reminder of the gospel, I think, is what's amazing here. The Father tells of his love, his pleasure in his Son before his Son is faithful in the face of his temptation. The Father says, I love you before He's faced with being tempted. I think God is awesome like that. Other gods are nowhere near like this when it comes to this. Every other religion is going to wait until you, they see whether you're faithful. They're going to wait to see if you're genuine, if you're strong, if you're obedient, before you can know that you're loved by the God of that particular religion. 
That's just how it is with that, but it's not how it is with the Bible. It's not how it is with the Christian faith. Friends, God declares his love for you. God declares his pleasure, his grace, and his faithfulness to you, to us, before and during and after. We either fall short or we remain faithful when we're tested, when we're tempted. And you might like just to think some more about that. That God loves you not dependent on your obedience. He loves you in spite of your disobedience. That's an amazing love. And, you know, as you think some more about that, think about this as well. I want to talk to people who are followers of Jesus, the Christians here. That if your doctrine of the Holy Spirit is that he exists for your pleasure, that if he exists for your convenience, then I think you need to think again. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, and if you're thinking about the Holy Spirit, doesn't entertain the idea that he can lead God's son into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, then you should think again. But I think in your thinking of that, what we need to do is dig deeper and go at least this. Just be amazed at Jesus. And this is why. Have a look at sentence two of chapter four. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, let these, uh, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's quoting from Deuteronomy, the law in the Old Testament. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And he's quoting Deuteronomy from the law. In the Old Testament. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it's written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he's quoting Deuteronomy from the law in the Old Testament. And the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. I mean, it's just. If you read that, it's just that it's amazing. If you really read it, friend, if you really look at what happens there. I mean, first of all, this sentence too, and I, I just love the understatement of the obvious that's there. It says after 40 days, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, it says he was hungry. <laughs> well, yeah, he was hungry. Thanks for that bit of information, Matthew. That's really helpful. But but I think it's important. Again, we need to read this and go, well, what is it actually saying? Jesus, he's hungry. But notice he's hungry. He's starving. 40 days of fasting in the desert. He's weak. He's vulnerable. Jesus would be struggling physically and emotionally and mentally at that point when Satan comes to him. You might remember, some of you, God's people, the Israelites, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. They were actually in the wilderness at the time when the passages were written that Jesus quotes back to Satan from Deuteronomy. They were in the desert. And remember, when they were in the desert, that they had a, a cloud to cover them, to give them shade in the heat of the day. They had a, a fire to give them heat in the, the, the freezing cold of the night. We're not told that Jesus had a cloud during the day. We're not told that Jesus had any fire during the night. See, Israel failed in the wilderness by not trusting that God would provide. They failed in the wilderness by not trusting that God would protect them. They failed in the wilderness by not following God's way and God's will. So it's interesting, isn't it, that when Satan comes to Jesus in his wilderness, in his weakness, in his vulnerability, he tests him with the temptation of food. 
He tests him with the temptation to doubt God's protection. He he tests him with the temptation to receive glory and success without suffering. And each time, Jesus says no to temptation's call. Each time Jesus says no to temptation, he's saying no to himself. And he's submitting himself to his father's will. And each time he's saying yes to God's eternal plan. You know, I think about, you know, if I was in, if I was Jesus in that situation, I tell you, I could easily justify changing stones to bread after fasting for 40 days. I could easily justify doubting that God is power enough to keep me safe. And, you know, just make sure I had a backup plan in case I needed one. I could easily make excuses for manipulating situations to make them less confronting, to take the suffering out of the equation and go the easy way instead. Sometimes, you know, I think I, I can justify just about everything, except for obvious sin. I reckon sometimes I can justify just about anything. You know, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't take shortcuts. Jesus didn't lessen the hardship because he'd had enough and just needed a break. See, at some point, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're going to do that today. But not Jesus. Never Jesus. We eventually give in to pressure, don't we? Just so that we can fit in. Jesus didn't do that. We eventually minimize the expectation. Just so that we can have a bit of worldly respite. Jesus didn't do that. His family didn't understand him. His friends didn't get him. His enemies grew in both number and hatred of him. But Jesus, the weight of being saviour, just kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And it cost him his life. And he does for us what we couldn't, what we wouldn't do for ourselves. Just imagine that, you know, he came to the Rurikura house for dinner. And unfortunately, I was cooking that night. Imagine you came to our place for dinner and you sat at the table and I put in front of you a bowl of flour and water, some salt, onion and garlic and mince, some tomatoes, some cheese, some herbs and spices. I put them in front of you. They'd enjoy the meal. You'd think I was nuts. You'd be right, but you'd think I was nuts. Crazy. But if I use those exact same things in the proper order and the proper time and added heat, and the end result was lasagna, uh, you'd probably appreciate those things much, much more, I imagine. See, I think we have to be careful when we come to this temptation narrative in Matthew chapter 4. See, if you think that the reason this passage is in our Bible is so that you can incorporate, go away and determine to incorporate the discipline of a quiet time, and you can go away and you can incorporate, you know, a a, a dedicated time alone with God, you can incorporate in your life a, a, a practice of fasting. If you think you can read this passage and think you can go away and all you have to, you know, you quiet time with God, incorporate fasting and memorize from scripture so that when you're faced with temptation, all you have to do is to do the magic things and say the magic words and the devil will flee and you'll have victory. 
Guys, that's like having the ingredients, but missing out on the real enjoyment of the real feast. Please don't go away from here with a commitment that you're just going to do better or do more and you'll be safe. See, I think Christians are in danger of having Jesus as our example, but forgetting that Jesus is our saviour and we need Jesus to be our saviour. Listen, the temptation narrative is here so that we will know, so that we can know that we can put our trust in Jesus because he never gave in to temptation. This is not a recipe for us to deal with temptation. It's for us to put our faith in Christ who never gave in to temptation. To sit at his feet and learn from him, yes, but to trust him and to dedicate our lives to him because he does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And his words. Then... We listen to his words and they are cosmically challenging, are they not? Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Don't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The word of God, the will of God, the worship of God. I just wonder what what will those three things look like in your life today? The word of God, the will of God, the worship of God. Jesus says no to turning stones to bread because Jesus is the bread of your life. Jesus says no to testing God because Jesus himself is the test for our own assurance of eternal life. Jesus says no to accepting worship and glory without suffering And Jesus is the focus then of our worship and the radiance of God's glory. He's the humble God. He denies himself so that he will be our food forever. He endures suffering so that we will be eternally protected. He is worshipped. Not because he short-circuited the cross, but because he endured it for you and for me. So what are we left with? (laughs) Friends, we are left with this. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. That's what the father says about the son. What do you say? Let's pray. God, we want to confess today that there are so many ways in which we fall short. We fall short of your will and your way and your word every day. And Lord God, we just thank you so much that our relationship with you is not dependent on, on our obedience or our performance. It's based on what you have done for us. You are perfect in your obedience to your Father's law. You never gave in to temptation. So it is right for us to put our trust in you. It is essential for us to put our trust in you. Where else were we to go? For you, Jesus, have the words of eternal life. You are God. There is no one like you. And so today, help us to say and to live out these words. You are the son of God. I love you. I'm pleased that you are Lord and king of my life. 
Help me to live in obedience from that reality into this week, into this day, into the rest of this fellowship. In your name we pray. Amen.